Hi, good morning. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Mesh Fletcher. I'm the Marketing Director at Ogilvy One Worldwide, and I'm also on the AdTech Advisory Board. And it gives me my great pleasure to be here this morning to be able to introduce you to Tom Daly from the Coca-Cola Company. Uh, Tom is Director, Mobile and Search, Global Connections for Coke. He uh, joined Coke from UPS five years ago, I beg your pardon, in 2005. And his key focus has been on selling Coke through the mobile devices. He's part of uh, Wendy Clark's team and uh, she gave such a rousing keynote this morning. I can't wait to hear more from Coke. So please join me in welcoming your mobile marketing master, Tom Daly. Thank you. Did everybody hear Wendy's keynote this morning? Show of hands. All right, so I'm toast. I am not, I am not gonna succeed here. Um, thank you everybody for being a part of this session. We have some great content um, that was designed um, with the prior knowledge around Wendy's keynote, right? So I had some insights into what Wendy was likely to be speaking about. We got some input from AdTech that many people in that keynote may find themselves in this room. Um, and then that in the following session, uh, I don't know if you don't have your day mapped out, we're gonna kind of weave a story. We started with the inspiration from Wendy. We're gonna talk about getting to great. So Wendy put a big emphasis on um, storytelling. And we're gonna try to talk about the notion of storytelling and what might make it great um, in the context of mobile. And we'll have Russell Wallach from Live Nation to give us a brand marketer's point of view on that. Um, and then we're gonna kind of switch and get um, to the other side of the story, which is what do consumers think about great mobile experiences? And we all know that what we do and what consumers want may or may not be the same things. So hopefully we get some good tension between points of view and we get a good debate, bring the consumer voice into what the marketers are doing, um, but we have some smart speakers, so I'm sure that they are, they are building the things that consumers are actually looking for. I'm gonna go through a, through, uh, a few slides to try to set the stage here um, and, and try as I might, I, if I'm on a good day, I will be one, one fraction of Wendy's inspiration. But, but so, so I can't do it myself, I have to look to others. Keith Reinhardt had this quote, all of us who professionally use the mass media are shapers of society. We can vulgarize that society, we can brutalize it, or we can help lift it to a higher level, right? So here's a real world madman talking about how to create sort of a higher order of society. Then you got Jerry Delafamino, the true inspiration. I happen to have the privilege of working for both of these guys along the way uh, in my career. And I just seriously dated myself. But um, looking for that larger cultural revolution, Jerry didn't believe it had hit and it had arrived, right? But we're looking for that, right? As you heard in Wendy's keynote, and if you weren't there, you know, the notion of tapping into culture to tell stories, authentic stories, true stories, not fake stories that you think you need to say to sell your products, but things that really tap into consumer and cultural truths is what we need to do, right? So how are stories being today? How are brands taking messaging from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, 70s, making it current using today's technology? And, and I would argue at the core of telling stories, and building brand relationships is a need to shift or, or to actually take advantage of the move from analog communications, right? These wave signs, these sort of light and sound things and move to something that taps into the digital, right? The bits and the bytes with the ability, right? To really connect and tell these truths. You heard a little bit about Wendy talking about um, Liquid and linked, right, at its core, two notions, content excellence. The teams within our business who are creating these stories to be told across multiple streams, right, ideas that are contagious and cannot be controlled, earning an unfair share of popular culture. But those same things need to be linked, right? They need to be um, linked across business plans, brand plans, consumer truths, um, and, and, and multiple screens, the story cannot be disconnected. So whether you're using voice, some of you saw that Fanta voice transformer example, um, sight and what a camera can take a picture of, sound, what people say, obviously this is a phone, there's a 
as we said, there are things that can record. Movement, motion detection, um, time and space, all of these things are possible with a mobile phone, right? And when we figure out how to use all of those capabilities to make those deep, truthful connections with consumers, that's real personalization. That's not hello, Tom. That is really getting into what, it, what people want. So mobile is going to empower storing tellings so brands win the hearts and minds of consumers, must convert exposure to experience in ways that assure the brand is a valued and required part of the story that participating in a musical event, going to a concert, going to the ballpark, going to the theater is made better because the brand has done something to add value to that experience. I often say that Coca-Cola's mobile strategy was written in the 1920s when Robert Woodruff, who was our chairman at the time, explained the role of the Coca-Cola company as putting our brands within arm's reach of desire. And that today, at the end of that arm, between it and desire is a mobile phone. And the simple choice that we face, that everybody in this room faces, is how will you make that mobile device an enabler of desire? Because if you make the alternative choice to be a barrier to desire, you have no role for mobile in your business. So the revolution that Jerry predicted is just getting started. The people in this room are this generation's mad men and mad women, right? We are the ones creating the iconic stories or the challenge we all face is creating these iconic experiences that people will be talking about for the next 30 years. Wendy referenced the Hilltop commercial earlier today. That commercial is about 35 years old. What is the hilltop of apps? What is the hilltop of a mobile web experience? How does location tap into something that we can build that people will be talking about 30 years from now? So let's prove um, to the world that good taste, good art, and good writing can be good selling. Right? Or if you're Jerry Delafamina, right, let's have some fun. Right? It's an amazing opportunity for all of us sitting in this room to figure out ways to bring these things to life and get to great. So with that, I'm um, happy to introduce Russell Wallach, who is president of the Live Nation Network, Live Nation Entertainment. He oversees all sponsorship programs across venues, online, social media, mo uh, mobile, artist platforms, um, at the world's leading live entertainment company. Um, I must note that Live Nation is a very valued customer of the Coca-Cola company, so I'm really excited to be able to introduce Russell and hear what he's got to say. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much, Tom. Uh, just really excited to be here uh, to, to hear you talk as well as Wendy and, uh, and her speech. It was really interesting to me, the conversation about experience and creating experiences for customers on the mobile device and storytelling. We've got a slightly different challenge. We're actually in the experience business, as I like to say. We do 22,000 shows a year. Every single one of those shows is an experience. At our venues all over the world, we are giving, um, and we have to give a better experience to those fans when they're in those venues the mobile device is going to help us do that. Um, we leave actually the storytelling to the brands. We want our brand partners to come in and do great storytelling to our customers, to our fans. The other interesting thing, we talk about, we, we refer to them as fans. I hear brands talk about them a lot as customers. The only time brands talk about uh, their customers as fans, many, in many cases, is on Facebook. How many fans do you have? I think it talks about passion. And, and we talk about the 100 plus million fans that we have that are going to shows 365 days a year. So our ecosystem is really about before, during, and after the show. And it's creating that experience for that fan 
um, throughout that ecosystem. And mobile being really one of the key drivers as we move forward to really enhance that experience. And whether that experience is buying the ticket or it's music discovery. You think about music has never been more popular today um, just because of all the different ways that you can find out about music and you can experience it, you can consume it, Spotify, etc. So there's so much out there for people to, to learn about it. But one of the challenges, also one of the opportunities, is how do we, how do we make it easier for the fans to purchase those tickets? So it starts with discovery. And how do bands do it now? They're doing it via social media. Well, how is the consumer finding out about that show? They're finding out about it because they have their device 24-7 and their favorite artist just sent out a tweet that tickets are going on sale. If you go back years, you, it was about a newspaper ad in the New York Times. Those days are gone from a, a communication on a one-to-one -one basis. So we communicate with about 80 million people on a weekly basis via email, localized, to tell you what shows are here in New York that you may be interested in based on past preference and purchase. Well, you're now getting that email via your smartphone. And the beauty is you now don't have to be sitting at your computer at 10 a.m. on a Saturday to purchase that ticket. You can purchase it right then and there when you get the email. The last one, the last piece, which really has changed our business dramatically this year, and while it's solving a challenge for us, it's also solving a huge pain point for the fan. 40% of, based on research we did, 40% of fans, our customers, did not go to a concert because they didn't know about it. Think about that as a marketing challenge. We didn't do a good enough job. We didn't spend enough money to let them know about that show. So all of a sudden, we launch our iPhone app that everything in your iTunes library is now linked um, into, your, into the app. So every time a band that's in your iTunes library is here in New York City, you get an email. Well, all of a sudden, we've solved a challenge for us, right? How do we tell more people about the show? How do we get more people to buy tickets? But we've also solved a pain point for the fan because they're now excited that they know about it. Ticketing. So for us, the mobile ticket has been a, a, a truly uh, changing the way we actually go and sell our tickets, but also the way the fan is, is acquiring and purchasing. So no longer are we standing in line at a record store. I don't even know if there are record stores anymore, but um, we don't do that anymore. I did that when I was a kid. Um, but now 80% of those tickets are sold online. If you think about it, right now, if I told you in five minutes Radiohead was going on sale, Every single person in this room, if you wanted to, could figure out how to buy tickets from your phone. When we, when we uh, researched our customer, 30% of them said they would absolutely buy a ticket via a mobile app. And then this year, we launched um, being able to, just like you can do with the airlines now and other places, get that uh, barcode right on your phone. Well, this is definitely more than just about saving trees. Um, this is about, hey, ease. I bought the ticket on my phone. I can now get the barcode on my phone. And when I go to the venue, really simple and easy. But think about that as us as marketers. And I'll come back to that. But the ability for us to know that you just walked into the venue, think about the opportunities that we, we can um, work on together. So one, one simple example, right, and everything we're doing right now in mobile, we're trying to figure out how we can bring brands along to be part of that experience, to tell that story, to deliver their message in a relevant way. It has to be relevant. So Bacardi um, is all about, they had a campaign about being together. Well, what is music about, right? It's about being together. It's about that experience with your friends. So we had a, uh, we had a mobile um, uh, text message program functionality that basically you saw a show and you could then easily text message that link right to your friends, tell you about the show, where it was, when it was, info on the band, right? Because still, the number one way that people find out about shows and 
and new music is through friends, through community. We're seeing that with what's going on on Facebook right now. So we actually incorporated and, rel and relevantly linked uh, Bacardi into that entire experience. So it was actually brought to uh, the, the fan by Bacardi, not by us. And we think, for, from, for us, that's what we're looking to do. Let Bacardi tell the story, let Bacardi be there in a relevant way, and we felt based on their campaign and their messaging that it worked really well for us. So, during the show, Tom and I talked about this um, uh, yesterday, he just mentioned it now, in terms of what the experience is when you go to the show. This is actually what gets me most excited every day, thinking about all the different ways that we may be able to interact with the, the fan, the customer, while they're there, um, and think about all of the fun, creative things that brands can do with them. So if we go from when, when I was at least a lot younger, um, dating myself, uh, when it was all about the lighter, that was the device of choice when the lights went out in the venue, well today it's the mobile device. And it's not just because it's dark and you've got the light from your cell phone, right? It's your communication device while you're at the show. But if we take that one step further to say, how are people using those devices when they're at the show? They're communicating, and it's interesting. They're talking to their friends that are at the show that may not be sitting with them, but they're also sharing that experience and letting everybody know about it um, you know, that aren't at the show. I remember, you know, I know I go to enough shows that, you know, five, ten years ago it was, you saw all these people like turn their phone on and there was a friend on the other side like trying to listen to a song through a cell phone. Well, now, you know, they're, they're taking that picture, they're uploading it to their social community. They are actually real time experiencing it with tens of millions of people that aren't there. The other part, going back to what I mentioned about the barcode, well, we now know you're in the venue. So why now we can, or brands can, give that opportunity to not just talk to your friends, but why can't you now talk to the band? And that's brought to you by State Farm, and they're, you're going backstage to a cool State Farm lounge because you're, you, you, we now know you're in the venue. And we're having this ongoing dialogue. Maybe it's getting you access into a VIP club. So the beauty of understanding that you're in the venue gives us the opportunity to find ways for brands to provide additional value and an experience on site that they couldn't get without you. Meaning, I got this because of Coca-Cola or I got this because of State Farm on site. And again, we let the brands figure out how to tell that story and how to deliver their message in a, in a way that really makes sense. Something that we tested this summer that will go broad next year. So you think about it, you're sitting in the nice seats, you don't want to leave um, to go to get concessions. Well, now you can order that, you can order your Coca-Cola right from your seat. We had another challenge though. What about the 15,000 people that are sitting on the lawn? Well, their challenge is they don't want to run off the lawn, sit in a 10 or 15 minute line for concessions, and then run back to the lawn. So through our mobile app, um, you can now buy, you can order your Coca-Cola from the lawn, and then two minutes later, you can run to the Coca-Cola fast lane line at concessions and pick it up. So if you think about it, we've solved a pain point for the fan, we've brought a brand, in this case, a co let's say Coca-Cola, to be part of that experience, actually giving the value. We're okay letting Coca-Cola get all the gratification and deliver that happiness message to the fan, um, and, and, and that for us is, is a huge, tremendous win. So those are the types of things that we're thinking about, and we'll look to take this type of platform and roll it out across all of our venues around the world. Um, in terms of uh, location-based services, QR codes. I've heard different numbers in terms of success rate in different areas. At live events, at our events, at our festivals, incredibly successful, incredibly valuable for the marketers that we're working with. Um, it's a time and a place. People are checking in without a doubt. But on site, the ability to, with, in this case, Red Laser, 
go interact with the QR code, and all of a sudden you're getting an acoustical performance by one of the artists that is actually playing in the festival, and it's only for a limited number of people. Well, that can, that can roll into hundreds of things. Again, that could be taking you backstage. That could be getting into a VIP club. That could be getting a discount on a beverage um, at the concession stand, $10 off a t-shirt. Again, there are so many things that we can do now because the fans are saying to us, they're giving us permission to talk to them while they're there at the venue. They're looking, they're telling us that they are looking for different experiences while they're there at the show. I think there's so many opportunities for brands to look at that beyond just the live event, but how can you create that experience? How can you provide that value in everyday life? So after the show, um, this is about extending the experience. So, you know, okay, we've got the before and during, but how do we take that and extend it beyond the show? Well, clearly, you, you, you know, we, we, we heard it from in, in past presentations, you know, the, everyone's uploading their photos to Facebook, they're sharing, um, you know, the music, they're talking about it, they're doing reviews, um, and these numbers, these are actually from last year, so I'm sure they're significantly, we'll do our research again with our fans um, uh, early next year, and I'm sure these numbers will continue to increase. But how do we continue to um, let that experience last and again bring brands along for that ride, whether that's through photo galleries, whether that's through special things that are happening after the show, whether that's maybe you getting a copy of the show you just heard at the concert. There's a lot of different things um, that we can be able to do there. And then there's also um, creating content. So something interesting we did uh, in Europe with, uh, with one of our partners there. So we encouraged you, the fan, when you're at the show, shoot the show with your phone. And after you're done, we'll take it, send it to us, we're gonna professionally edit it, and we actually create crowdsourced music videos that they could then take and, and have and share and create an entire viral world of all of these crowdsourced, professionally edited music videos with their footage. And there's lots, it's music industry, so there's always lots of rights <laughs> issues with things like that. But we were able to create the program, and the bands actually began to see the value of it, and the fans loved it. So we think, again, this is one little idea, but it's these types of ideas that brands are actually coming to us and saying, hey, how can we integrate at the show? How can we extend that experience? And together, we look to offer those, um, those ideas and opportunities um, with the ultimate goal being to create a more enhanced, a better experience while you're at the event. So really, in, in kind of ending here, I'll just say that uh, from a mobile perspective, uh, we see, from a mobile marketing standpoint, incredible opportunity to uh, continue to enhance the experience. And for us, enhanced experience actually drives revenue. It will drive more ticket sales. It will drive more merchandise sales. It will drive more concession sales. But doing all of those things, the fans are actually telling us we are thrilled to be a part of it. We are excited that you're talking to us. We're excited that you're communicating with us. Um, and so, uh, you know, with that, I'll, uh, I'll hand it back to, to you. Thank you, Russell. Just to clarify our format, we'll have our speakers um, make their presentations um, sequentially, and time permitting, we'll bring everybody back up for a Q&A. Um, so I think you heard loud and clear in the programs and thinking within Live Nation Entertainment, this um, understanding of you know, wh where is it not great for their consumers? What role can mobile play to get to great, removing various pain points, and create the, the environment that drives sales. You didn't see a lot of Live Nation branding in the various experiences. Yes, there was an app. That one made sense, right? But if Coca-Cola can be a part of getting you back to the show faster, have at it. Every, consumers get what they want. Live Nation gets what they want. Concessionaire gets. Everybody wins, right? That triple bottom line. So I think some great, great examples. Um, 
Continuing in this theme of getting to great, it is um, a blinding flash of the obvious that we need to understand the consumer point of view. And we need to understand what is it that they want, what, what things about the mobile device that everybody carries with them is changing expectations. And as you heard, again, assuming that people were in the keynote, a lesson to attend the keynotes, um, you heard in that pie observation from Rennie, right, there may be some little things in the anomalies. There may be things in the data that seems an aberration that prove to be really insightful. But at the same time, maybe you have to look at the broad spectrum of data, and the fact is that you know, if 99 out of 100 people want something, well, maybe, maybe you ought to be doing that. So um, to share some insights, our, our next two speakers, Neil Burns, professor and uh, director for the Center of Brand Research at the University of Texas at Austin, and Jia Zhang, a strategist with AKQA, will join us. Um, Dr. Burns um, has an advertising background, um, laments that he is a man without a role. The advertising folks view him as a left-brained academician, and the academics view him as a right-brained advertising guy. Um, couldn't be a better combination for us. Uh, Gia brings a very broad global perspective to mobile. Um, in her work with AKQA, have supported many global clients, has done some research specifically um, on consumer trends both in China and, and in the United States. So with that introduction, we'll welcome you both to the stage. I did this just to give her a chance to. Uh... So um, I'm sorry for the dropping things. I'm, I'm actually uh, known to be clumsy, and so you just saw a demonstration of that well-earned reputation. Um, G and I um, don't have a beverage to sell, and we don't have an application to sell. Um, we, are, um, we are in advertising, and we're interested in studying the relationship, which I think is at the core of advertising, that we have to each other and the relationship that people have with products and services. So let's just start. Um, the growth in technology that you've gotten a feeling of the past two days here and virtually in every presentation that you hear. Um, I just want to make sure that we have the right. Yeah, uh, uh, this, I think we want to move when to this closed, it was supposed to open up to ours. Excuse me one second. Let me just try swapping displays. Let's try that. I don't think that that does it, by the way, because it's, it's still on this projector, and, and, and uh, I have to find out how to close his system. If, if you think you can do that, why don't you? It's on this computer. And you can, yeah, OK. Cool. I think we've been able to do it. Um, as I was saying, the phenomenal technology, the growth of the technology, the, the particular spread that we've, that we've all seen, not only here, of course, but in, in nations like China, of, of mobile technology and its acceptance is really part of the reason that, that we got interested in it and essentially The comment was that this is interesting. I, I hope you guys feel that way about it. Um, uh, we didn't set it up in dual display mode. Actually, the chap who was working did that. So while we're all sitting here and talking, um, one of the things that's interesting to me, and I'll probably, re, you know, I'll probably make another reference to it when we, when we get the PowerPoint going, 
is what do we do with, with things like, like brands and, and, and products? And as you heard from Tom, I spent a large part of my life working with a, a bicycle, uh, actually a motorcycle, called, called Harley. And uh, something in the order of 20 years in building not, a, not something as strong and as powerful and as world-renowned as Coke, but not too bad. And what I began to realize um, was the experience and that people didn't buy Harley, they joined Harley. Do we have any riders out here? Any? Do we? Oh, I should do two things. Any UT people out here? Hook them horns? Cool. Thanks, guys. And, and secondly, let's make a bow, a serious bow to the hogs. And that's where the idea came from, that people joined the brand. And I'll suggest to you today that people joined the brand. And the interesting phenomenon that we're struggling with, or that G and I have been looking at, is how is the brand represented in mobile? And finally, you know, the notion comes to you that brand representation varies as a function of media that's being used. And so the kind of representation that we give it on TV is different than the kind of repre representation, for example, that we give it in digital outdoor. And those, of course, are clearly different. And digital outdoor, by the way, is particularly fascinating. It's, it's interesting to watch them. You know, it's a fascinating process. So that's kind of the background that we, you know, that we brought to this. And, and to tell you how we got involved in this particular thing, uh, Gia, who is now a strategist at AKQA in San Francisco, uh, after she completed her early education and working in advertising in China, uh, had the great wisdom to come to the University of Texas and enter our graduate program in advertising. And as part of her thesis work, she became interested in crowdsourcing and in collaborative consumption. The book came out, What's Mine is Yours. It captivated several of our students, and in particular, Gia. And so she launched a study. We got a problem with this? The, the password on this computer? No. Oh. She's going to get that straightened out. She's very good, much better than I am. And you'll notice that she doesn't drop things. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great skill. I think as you get older, you kind of lose the sensitivity. By the way, do you, do you notice how every man who gets up has some comment to make about his age? We, we just can't cope with it, <laughs> particularly as we look at the young people who are sitting in this, in this group. Um, and so that, that gave us our start. The work that she did on her, on her master's, you know, during her master's program involved doing some surveys about collaborative consumption in China and in the U.S., and it essentially gave us the framework, the design for the study we're going to tell you about. We had two, two great helpers that I'll, that I'll just mention to you so I don't have to waste the time talking about them later, and they should be acknowledged. Um, one is called Group M. As some of you may know, Group M, Group M is part of WPP. They've got a large office in, in, in Shanghai. I visited with them and encouraged them to distribute our survey. And so they distributed our survey in China. And we got about 250 responses there. A firm called Kinetics, which is an Austin-based company, and it's one that I've worked with, did the US uh, distribution. And we only got about 100 responses there. And so it's interesting that the Chinese you know, responded more, more frequently. And as you'll see, the nature of the vehicle they used to make the response also varied in an, in an interesting way. I'm sure there's a cool way of handling this cord. Actually, in the past, it's been strung through my shirt so that, you know, it's, uh, and it's, but it's, you know, it's there. It's not as cool as I'd, I'd like to appear. Have you got that on? Yeah, it's from this it's, it's, it's from this computer. Okay, and so this is the title. We're trying to compare the use of mobile and looking at collaborative consumption in these two countries. And I've, and I've mentioned that. And Gia's going to take you through, essentially, the agenda that we've got for you today. And I'm really apologetic for, for the issue. I should assure you that at one point we had this thing working, OK? And, and I think, you know, both in presentations and in the world of the internet, that it's just great. The only problem we have is the computer. So go ahead. So our research is about mobile's impact on retail and social from a consumer's perspective. What are they getting, and what do they really want? First, we're going to show 
First, we're going to show a short summary of what others have predicted about the future of mobile. And secondly, we're going to take a look at the current impact mobile has on retail. Then we will walk you through our research, a survey we did in both China and USA, that looked at consumers' usage behavior on mobile. We will also show you some highlights of the result, including the similarities and differences between two countries in content, contacts, and collaboration. Um, and last, we will provide points of view drawn from our findings. I'd like to mention that we have considerable data, but we will focus today only on a few of the issues that caught our attention due to time limitation. Um, but again, we're happy to share the entire presentation with you afterwards. So here what you're seeing is a chart of the adoption curve of mobile in retail. And there's um, several stats that indicating in about five years from now, the usage of mobile device in retail will hit critical mass. So what is mobile's current impact on retail environments? Because of mobile contributed a large part to the movement of price transparency, mobile, had, mobile was blamed for some negative impact on retail, such as high-end brand erosion and overstore issues of retailers. We know that stores like Sears has to lease out space to outsiders. These are, those all happened when consumers started to buy things more online with cheaper price, of course. Um, however, on the other hand, by providing um, more relevant and immediate information to consumers, mobile devices nowadays become more of a facilitator in retail environment. Which bridges the gap between offline and online world. Um, we've seen here examples like Shopkick or Groupon now function as a virtual extension of physical stores that help retail retailers enter consumers' world at the most relevant moment. So now Dr. Burns is going to talk about our research. I've already given you sort of a brief concept as to what it is we did. Let me also just repeat the, the comment that Gia made. Uh, those of you that are really interested in, in looking at the data, both the raw data and its correlations, will be glad to share that with you. The data we collected was collected in the past three weeks. We closed it down on Friday. Okay, and, and so you can imagine that we've been looking at this data and we'd still like to look at it some more, but I think we've got some meaningful things to, you know, to share with you about it. And it's kind of an interesting data pack, quite frankly. Uh, the survey consisted of, of 12 items and that includes some of the demographic data that we wanted to collect and we'll share that with you. And you know, primarily we looked at age and education, gender and time spent. And um, let me show you. Uh, something that was surprising to us, which was how, how similar in, in almost every respect the two samples were. The green sample that you see to the left, for example, 47% of the Chinese sample were male, 46% of the US sample were, were male. The, the only really interesting difference that we found was in the age group called 26 to 49. That was really a combination of two age groups. 52% of them, 52% of the Chinese fell into that age group, whereas 65% of the um, of, of the Americans did. Um, another interesting uh, you know, note to us was uh, you know, the kind of difference that was spent on using their mobile devices and on the, um, uh, you know, the ownership of the devices. And so you'll see that with regard to tablets, uh, you know, 28% of, of our sample in, in China had tablets. And uh, that, yeah, and 31% and of the Americans uh, had tablets. 90 and 93 were the two, two numbers for the, uh, uh, you know, the use of the mobile device. This chart becomes interesting and we, we did a preliminary analysis on what were the most popular activities that, that they used their mobile devices for. Within the Chinese sample, the internet, making phone calls, interestingly enough, and reading and music became important and significant, and they were the four most important and frequently used mobile activities. We've tried to give you a comparison here with a, you know, using, using a number of icons. Uh, I'm sure that you have an easier time understanding the icons than, than I do. And what we're showing you is the number of minutes that's, that's spread. Uh, you know, for example, if you take a look at the phone, you'll find it, and, and you probably have that indication already from previous comments that I made, that some 18 minutes was spent during a day making phone calls. Within the US sample, about 20 minutes. In terms of reading, for example, you, and, and, and that's what the Amazon icon is there. 
And this is reading and news. Um, what was interesting to us was the significant you know, difference there was 14 minutes were spent a day within the Chinese sample and only four minutes a day within the US sample. Just a, a sidebar comment. Um, last week I was in New York. Uh, it was the last week or a week, week and a half ago, and we had that terrible storm that came in on a, a Friday evening. And I had, a, I had a meeting Friday morning, and I was, dressed, I was dressed like an adult. I didn't wear jeans. I was wearing a shirt and a tie. But I wanted to go see the Occupy Wall Street. And so I went there, and um, I, I went back again on Saturday dressed appropriately in jeans and a T-shirt. Um, <clears throat> There's a, and if you've been there, maybe you've seen the same guy, sort of a heavy set large man carrying a Chinese flag, okay, and, 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 and Chinese, an American Chinese newspaper, and standing nose to nose with the policeman, and, and, but speaking as if he were an orator, uh, about how the United States has to save itself and, and become a country like China. And to my left were two people from China uh, who, who were taking pictures of this guy. And, and, and they spoke English, and I asked them how long I would last in Beijing, holding an American flag in the Chicago Tribune. And uh, they said, not long. Uh, so that, you know, there's, there are some interesting differences. And the reason that I mention that is that we both felt that the access that the Chinese now have to essentially global news and, and things they can read that, in, in, in a sense, may be more available to them than they've been in the past account for the 14 minutes spent on news reports as, as opposed to the US sample with four minutes. Um, what else should I comment on that you might find interesting? YouTube, uh, about nine minutes. And, and, and you know, that's, uh, that's actually video and looking at photographs. And within the US sample, only three minutes. The differences, and I, you know, I think the largest differences, um, in terms of listening to music, um, 14 minutes within our, within our Chinese sample, and only two minutes. Uh, um, within the US sample, the gaming issue is also interesting. So there's a sense in which as we looked at these data, we felt that sort of personal, personal enrichment that they could achieve from their mobile uh, devices was greater and of more importance within the Chinese sample than perhaps within the American sample. We also asked them the question, you know, uh, have they used mobile more within the past year than they did about a year ago? And as a consequence, what were they giving up? And here you see the numbers again for China and for the US. Radio, 23% said they're using it much less of the Chinese sample, 9.5% within the American sample. And if you look across the board, you see an interesting you know, difference. And, and, and the, the, I don't know what you want to call it, the denigration or the absence of use of the PCs. In, in China, only about 16% of the sample reported that they had decreased their use of their PCs as opposed to 34% essentially. Within, within the American market. So um, the, data, the, data, the data set becomes interesting. I think there are some interesting suggestions there as to what we need to do. And you begin seeing a theme, as, a, as I think Gia will describe in more detail, of the importance of relevance. And the previous speakers have both mentioned the importance of personal relevance. So by that, we mean mobile context. The context or the situation and million in which the message is delivered are critical and determine the message's acceptance and sharing. Um, the advertiser, oftentimes we found that, is still, not, is still only partially knowledgeable about those variables, which includes where consumers are, who they're with, time of day, and what, the, what they're doing when the message is delivered. Um, so our participants received and finished the survey on various platforms, could be computers, phones, including normal phones or smartphones, or tablets. Which we found out is 97%, I think it's, yeah, 97% of American respondents responded to the survey on computers, while it's 80%, 80% of Chinese respondents did, did the survey on their phones. While we looked at the context, when they were filling out their survey, it turned out that the likelihood of respondents being with friends and families as well as in public envi environments was higher among the Chinese. Um, so think about that. They might be more likely to talk to people they're with about the message they just received. That just occurred to us that mobile device as a platform has the potential of sparking real-time interaction and immediate actions compared to con computers. And which you, haven't, you, you wouldn't see from here is 
we did another, um, we asked another question about um, geolocation, because that is a very important variable of context for sure. So we asked their user of services like Foursquare and Guala, and the reasons why or why not they use those services. I'm not going to show all the data here, but in general, Chinese respondents are more interested in using geolocation social media. Deals and receiving loyalty points are the two most important reasons for them to use those services. While American respondents are more concerned about privacy issues and use them more for connecting with friends. And then after context, let's talk about content. What are their most desirable content? And our respondents clearly have the option to view or ignore a message delivered to their mobile device. An outcome or that decision we found in this study to depend upon the following. So what you're looking at here is um, the question is rank the following from one to five, which where one means very likely and five means very unlikely in terms of likelihood that you will check or share the content being sent to them, um, being sent to their mobile device at the moment they're not notified. And what you're looking at, the scores here is, on the left bar is the checking, is the main score of the likelihood consumers are going to check the content. And the right bar is about sharing. So, which means the lower the score is, the more likely respondents will take the actions, check or whether it be check or share the content. Um, which we can see from here is location and familiar identity top the list of desired content showing impact of re relevance and trust. The data showed these two criteria are both important for receiving and sharing the information for our U.S. sample. Well, if we looked at the Chinese sample, discounts and viral content top the list among the Chinese, while discounts and relevancy to real-time location and activities top the list of sharing in that sample. So if we, so what do those, if we look at the comparison between those two data sets, U.S. consumers are more cautious of checking and sharing content in general. While discounts seem to be the most desirable content to Chinese participants, it was the second from, from the bottom among U.S. participants. Responses here may reflect that U.S. participants may be relatively affluent or that irrelevancy or the overwhelming flow of information might be the causes as well. Um, but mobile has already shown the inverted U-shaped curve phenomenon. The constant influx of, influx of messages to our mobile devices has a negative effect on the messages, that, on the messages desirability. I, th I guess many of you would have this feeling if you, have, if you like me, have like over a thousand emails in my, email, in my inbox. Um, sample from both countries seem least likely to check or share information, even if it comes from sites of which they're members of or if it concerns deals or coupons. The overall likelihood of sharing dropped a little bit, you can see from the chart here, um, in general compared to checking, which suggests that our respondents have higher criteria and are more cautious about sharing information. So what do those data mean? What do those comparisons mean? I think it's very simple. In general, let's say gaining likes or members on your own or shared media is only the first step. It doesn't guarantee that if they are, even though consumers are members or fans of your of your site or page that so doesn't guarantee they will check or even share your content. And again, discount is not always the king. The only way to address those issues is to make the content, whether it be discounts or Facebook posts on Facebook, 24-7 personal relevant. Just before you change the slides, some of you who may be careful readers, both Gia and I are, um, because I'm in Texas, I had Governor Perry proofread. And, and, um, and I'll just go on from that. Um, those of us who are well educated in China and in the Chicago school system spell, spell well. Sorry about that. Um, now I'm lost. Data analysis. Okay, let's go back to. I hope there's no spelling. Well, we have mistakes. A, it, it, here. Governor, governor says that's how collaborative is spelled, and I, I don't want to argue with him. <laughs> So um, this is about the mobile usage um, and collaborate, uncollaborative site. Um, we asked a question about have you ever used a mobile device and collaborative sites to make purchases? Oh, sorry, that's the reasons of why they use that. Um, what you see again on the left bar is the, um, is the percentage of Chinese samples and the right bar is the percentage of US samples. In our early study, trust in general, largely due to the Chinese culture practice, was an important determinant of willingness to enter into commerce. Trust is really important. And suspicion of authority and government also impacts willingness to trust. 
However, if you can see from here, our data also shows that trust and confidence are enhanced via technology. The peer collaborative community, where they're members of maybe certain sites and they talk to each other, they share some content, they become sort of online friends and they kind of build this trust. As well as when consumers are more familiar with the technology and the services, as we can see here that more, more, Chinese, more Chinese respondents have used collaborative sites to make purchases, which kind of enhance the confidence they have in this technology, which will also, there, which will also increase the use, usage of certain sites. Well, just to wrap it up, um, there's an interesting phenomenon we felt that our data will, just illustrates beautifully, and it's that technology itself, particularly among the Chinese, helps establish trust. Culturally, by the way, this is a group, this is a nation, where purchasing is generally made within family and friends and well-established relationships. Mobile and its use of mobile, the geolocation, its, its emphasis on geo and on local, really shows the kind of trust that can be established rather quickly with this device, and that trust also goes to the brand. The issue as to what the hell is the brand becomes an interesting question, okay, particularly as we look at some of the collaborative efforts. When the speaker starts speaking fast, you know, he's gotten a glance like from Tom that says, what the hell. Um, uh, the context, by the way, is I think not as, not as well recognized within the situation as it needs to be. We all had the experience early on when direct marketing would ring our phone during dinner. And time of day, uh, health situation, are you happy? Um, uh, are you with a group, as Gina, you know, as Gia suggests, or are you in your office by yourself? These are these are really really important contexts, and for some people, privacy becomes an important issue. Had an interesting aspect of privacy on the one hand, and personal relevance on the other. When Live Nation spoke about how it's able to tie in your 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 music on your computer to the significance of a particular event, and the likelihood of that message being opened is extremely high. And personal relevance, quite frankly, in my mind, rules. Um, what happens next? I mean, who the hell knows? You can look at this slide, and if you want the presentation, we'll, we'll give it to you. I'll just suggest this. I don't think the world of advertising any longer is going to be so obsessed with concepts of reach and frequency. I think the issue right now is not CPM, it's CPE, the cost per thousand engagements. Engagement is where it's at. Engagement builds the brand. And mobile is just a beautiful mechanism for, for, for developing a level of engagement that, quite frankly, we haven't seen before. Uh, again, we want to thank uh, you guys for listening to us and for putting up with some of our technical problems. We also want to acknowledge, again, the great help we got from Group M and from Kinesis. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Do you want to come to the stage with me and you can get set up while I introduce you? Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to... We're going to hedge our bets. I'm going to introduce as we set up here. Thank you both. So what we promised uh, as key takeaways in this session were you know, innovative ways to reach consumers. You heard a little bit of our company's point of view on, on how to think about that. We saw some real examples and ways of thinking about that with Live Nation. Um, we promised some insights um, into the consumer mindset. And you can see that while there are some broad themes that are common, there are nuances. Maybe that's an obvious statement, but the point would be that as, you, uh, as we speak to the third promised takeaway, which is getting your brand ready for mobile, right? the details matter. Everybody talks about mobile being a personal device. Understanding the nature of the consumer's relationship with that device, respecting it, um, but at the same time, exploiting it is the opportunity that you have. Um, so our final speaker, and I don't think we'll have time for a, a Q&A, but our final speaker is Ray Pun. He is the um, Senior Manager of Product Marketing uh, within Adobe's Digital Marketing Business Unit. Um, Adobe is a gracious sponsor of this session, so we thank you and your company for its support. Um, and for those of you um, who will be staying on to the second session, what Ray has to say and what the the tools and services Adobe provides are the natural bridge. We talked about for the last 50 minutes getting to great content, right? But the next session is going to be about how to get from connections to expressions, right? So understanding the nature of the engagement, understanding what it is that is working, what is not working is critical. And if you don't have tool sets like those offered by Adobe, um, you're in a world of hurt. So I look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you, Tom, for the introduction. 
Again, I'm part of the uh, digital marketing business unit of Adobe, and uh, today the key question I'm going to ask you is, in terms of mobile marketing, do you have the right mindset? So my agenda is, is going to be pretty brief. I'm going to make a brief introduction to Adobe and our digital media solutions, our digital marketing solutions, and also present a very interesting case study from one of our clients, uh, MTV Networks, uh, now known formally as Viacom Networks. But at Adobe, our mission is really to change the world through digital experiences. We heard today from both Coca-Cola, Live Nation, how to build some of these great experiences. We really provide the solutions, whether it's on television, print, mobile, web, all of these various channels, we provide the solutions to help you build those great experiences. Specifically, the challenge you face as a marketer in this emerging world is we first started off with feature phones. Now we have smartphones. Now we have tablets. We even have internet-connected television devices. So consumers can absorb this content from many different channels, and you need to actually build experiences, optimize for every one of these channels. How do you do that? Well, at Adobe, in terms of digital media, we have a great tradition with our creative suite providing the capabilities to build both native applications, uh, content on the web, uh, digital magazines. We have clients such as Condé Nast have recently introduced magazines optimized for the tablet. And so these experiences require new uh, capabilities to build them and have a consistent experience so that both on tablet, smartphone, internet TV, you're able to do that in terms of a consistent um, you know, mechanism. Now, creativity is really the first step, and it's really the whole concept of left brain versus right brain. Many folks here in the advertising world focus on creativity. That's great. But one of the key challenges for marketers is that if you have to report results to the VP of marketing, the CMO, they want results. How do you do that? Well, first you have to understand measurement. Measurement of the tablet experience. I have an example here from Martha Stewart and their Living Magazine. In this tablet experience, what does it mean in terms of how frequently people engage with that experience? How much time do they spend? How much time do they spend hovering over the interactive rich advertising? That's the first step. Second step is to provide the analytics to understand the effectiveness. So if folks are using tablet devices, what types of tablets are they using? How much does this impact conversion rates? Is an iPad better than an Android device? Understand those metrics. That's really the second step. The third step is really, once I have the data to say how I'm doing today, how do I get to the next level? How do I optimize the experience? How do I move conversion rates from a low percentage to an even better percentage next year? So let's move into the case study. And this is going to be a, a really interesting example of MTV and their brand. MTV historically has been known to serve kind of the, the young adult audience. But over the years, MTV has actually grown its brands to serve multiple audiences, many different ethnicities, many different age groups. And this programming is achieved really via two, uh, two key channels. One is via shows, so shows like the Jersey Shore, events like the MTV uh, v Video Music Awards. These are really two channels of programming that allow MTV to connect with their consumers. So what's really the, 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 the audience profile of MTV? For the core brand, uh, the demographic is skewed to a slightly younger demographic. Uh, slightly more uh, you know, female as well. On the right-hand side, you see a chart here of mobile devices. This is basically analyzing what types of devices are being used to connect with content. You see a breakdown between both Android and iOS devices and also uh, feature phones. So what was really the goal of the case study here? MTV uses SMS messaging to reach their consumers. And the goal was to really to drive better um, optimization of and monetization of revenue through SMS. How do we do that? Many folks feel that SMS is somewhat passe, it's just text. How do you optimize SMS? Well, here's an example. Basically, we have some examples of text messaging uh, regarding 
both the Jersey Shore program and also uh, the Twilight movie series featuring an actor, uh, Robert Pattinson. Inside of the text messaging, I've highlighted two spots where there are actually text ads embedded inside of the messaging. In addition, there are links or URLs that take the consumer to additional content. So one of the examples here says, you know, if you want to see uh, the highlights of Snooki going out on a date with a girl, please click here. When you click through, it takes the consumer to the mobile web, and there's a second monetization point because there's actually an ad here from Toyota providing additional monetization. So what did MTV you know, want to do here to, to really uh, increase their, or to achieve their goal of increasing click-throughs and reducing opt-out? There's basically several parameters they saw within the messaging. They said, can I influence or change the time of day that I receive the message? How long the message is, the frequency, how do I optimize these various parameters? And the way that you do this is really via the scientific method or the scientific process. Conduct a test, set up two audiences, conduct an A-B test, and then see what results you receive. And here's what MTV learned. Basically, that uh, 6 p.m. is the best time to receive the message. It re provides the best click-through. Also, to message on weekdays versus weekends. To also message uh, shorter messages. And also, photos are more effective for, for driving click-throughs. In terms of the, the data here, the first line is actually very impressive. Initially, before the test began, the opt-out rate, folks opting out of SMS, was up there at you know, 9%. After the testing, after the optimization, they reduced opt-out down to around 2%. The same thing was true for the click-throughs, driving click-throughs from about 1% you know, up to uh, 2%. And so this is really um, you know, a demonstration of how using this method, they're able to collect the data and then optimize these results. In addition, is regarding mobile page views. How many people actually consumed more data via the, via the mobile web? We see here via the results, there are some spikes in the data due, due to breaking news, but fundamentally, um, this you know, provided some key takeaways for MTV in closing. Number one, learn about your audience, understand what kind of devices they're using uh, to consume this media, uh, understand you know, you know, what triggers their attention, also, for their example, message regularly. So having frequent messaging provides more in interaction and engagement with the audience. And lastly, uh, offer something valuable. It doesn't have to be monetary reward. It can be uh, interesting information inside news on the actual shows. That actually engages folks and helps them to um, you know, interact better with this particular brand. So with that, I'd like to close and uh, turn it back to Tom. Thanks.